Hello and welcome to the third in our special lockdown series on the history of Fort St. George. Yesterday we looked at the cupola of Cornwallis and the statue that was supposed to stand under it and how between the two of them they travelled all over the city along with the cenotaph that stood on Cenotaph Road. Today we are going to look at 32 pillars that travelled not just within the city but hold your breath, they travelled all the way to Pondicherry and came back. And if they were able to speak, they'd tell you about how they've travelled in the 18th century. These 32 pillars that I speak of today are on the wall in front of the verandas of the assembly building. You just can't miss them. There are four to every section, beautiful in black. And all of them of the same design and construction. To understand the reason why these pillars really came up, we have to understand the layout of the fort as, as it existed in 1710. Remember, this was today this is the outline of the fort. But in 1710, this was all that there was to it. And you had the sea, the Bay of Bengal. And on this side, you had what was called the Ilambore River, which today doesn't exist, but forms a part of the Buckingham Canal and then flows into the sea. So all people who had to come by ship came here, they stopped somewhere here, and then they made the crossover and came into the city of Madras. But you must remember that Madras had no harbour for almost the first 250 years of its existence. All ships stopped two miles in the sea at a place called Madras Roads. And a series of rafts, Katti Maram, that is pieces of wood tied together by coir rope and rowed by native craftsmen. These Katti Marams, which is why in English you have the word catamaran, they all went up to the ships, they received the passengers and goods, and then they rode them and brought them back onto the land. The last stretch, 500 meters or so, no boat could make it, especially when laden with goods and passengers. All the passengers would be made to get onto the shoulders of these oarsmen and they would then wade ashore. It was believed that around 60% of all the people who boarded the ships in Dover or Southampton, they died on the way. Of the balance 30%, it was said that the toughest bit was negotiating that last two miles between the place called Madras Roads where the ships stopped and the place where they had to land on the seashore. Now, imagine having travelled all the way, you are sick, you are vomiting and then you are loaded onto somebody's shoulder and then you have been brought all the way to Madras city. The weather is of course either hot or it's hotter or it's at its hottest and then you land over here in the blazing white sand. Most people were not at their best when they landed in Madras. But there was a governor of Madras, George Morton Pitt, who became governor in 1730. He decided that no matter what happens, we are English and we have to present the best picture when we land over here. And for that, we need a colonnade. We need a beautiful ceremonial colonnade through which we can be welcomed as soon as we land on this colonial land. And so he decided that he was going to put up 32 pillars 16 on each side to welcome everybody, especially the governor, as and when the governor chose to travel. And for this, he chose locally available material, granite or gneiss, as it was known, that was available in the Pallavaram hills. Till now, all the granite or gneiss had been used for making a very, very useful product, tombstones. The Dutch had specialized in it. And after the Dutch, the English, all their tombstones were made with palavaram granite. The granite was sent all the way to Calcutta to make tombstones for the people, the English who died there. Job Charnock, the man who founded Calcutta, is buried under a piece of palavaram granite. That is why the English gave it the name Charnockite. They named it after him. And it was this granite that George Morton Pitt used to design his 32 pillars. When the bill was sent to London for the East India Company to pay, the directors there were not very happy. They were in fact extremely unhappy with George Morton Pitt, but nothing could be done. 32 solid granite pillars had been put up on the shores of Madras. They couldn't be dismantled in a hurry. There is only one visual record of how these pillars looked. And for that, you have to see this painting done in 1792 and look at the extreme right where you will find some of the pillars 
stretching out into the distance. That was the colonnade that reached all the way to the sea. Now the pillars, Pitt went back to England in 1737, 1735 or 36, and the pillars stayed on till 1746. In 1746, two Frenchmen decided that enough was enough and we needed to conquer Madras. Jean-Francois Duplay, who was the governor of Pondicherry, and De La Bourdonnais, who was the admiral in charge of the French fleet. The two of them, they didn't get along with each other at all, but on this they were quite united. They connived and De La Bourdonnais came up with a fleet of ships, bombarded Madras, the British promptly fled. Madras in 1746 became a French position. The first thing the French did was to dismantle those 32 pillars. The directors of the East India Company in England must have been quite delighted that they had got rid of it. The pillars went all the way to Pondicherry where Duplex decided that they would stand in a circle and eventually have a statue of himself right in the middle. Today, you do have a colonnade of pillars in the Pondicherry seashore, but these don't belong to this set. These are all taken from the Venkatramana Swami temple in Chenji. And eventually, there was a statue for Duplex in the middle. Today, that statue has been shifted and there is a statue of Mahatma Gandhi right in the middle. In 1749, Madras was returned to the British following a treaty between the British and the French. The English came back and they decided it's a matter of prestige. We need to get those 32 pillars back from Pondicherry. But they had to wait for 13 long years. It was only in 1762 when Sir Ayer Coote laid siege to Pondicherry and laid it waste completely that all those 32 pillars were eventually dragged all the way back to Madras. But this time, there was no colonnade that was going to be constructed. It was decided that a go-down would be put up. The East India Company had decided that they'd do something useful with the 32 pillars. And what they decided was that they would have a square building put up with these pillars standing on all four sides, walls being built in the middle, and this would be converted into a go-down right at the entrance of the fort. And you can see that building right over there. You can see those black pillars, in fact. What happened eventually was, while this was being constructed, there was a change of plan. The governor decided that he needed a banqueting hall. So the idea of a go-down was given up, and this became a banqueting hall. That is how it remained till 1802, when Edward II Lord Clive decided that he needed a much larger banqueting hall and built one on Mount Road, which we today know and know as Rajaji Hall. And then this hall was completely given up. It became a go-down once again. In 1911, Madras Presidency got what was known as its Legislative Council. And so a large Legislative Council building had to be built, just where the go-down was standing. They decided that they would dismantle the go-down. But we had a Scots governor, Sir Arthur Lolly, and like all good Scotsmen, he was the picture of thrift. And he said, why waste 32 beautiful granite pillars when they are available? Use them as a design element and put them up inside the building itself. Which is why today the assembly building has got those pillars put up on all sides. And this is a picture taken in 1911. And this is a contemporary picture of how they look today. For some reason, we decided that polishing these pillars repeatedly is a bad idea. So we've given it a coat of permanent black paint, which has completely destroyed the gleaming look of those pillars, but they still make for a very, very handsome display. Now, these are all the books that we have used today as reference in today's talk. And these are all the acknowledgements for some of the pictures that we have got. Before I leave you for today, let me leave you with a small factoid. We know that the English came here for trading in cloth. But do you know what the East India Company directors in England were most fond of? They loved urha, mango pickles and radish pickles. These were known as achar. You know, they always refer to it in the Hindi term. These achars were sent as gifts every time ships went back from here. I leave you with that fact and I look forward to meeting you soon once again when we will look at yet another aspect of Fort St. George's history, the story of the Church of St. Mary's which is the oldest Anglican church east of the Suez Canal. Bye-bye till then and stay safe and be careful. Have a great time. See you. Bye.